Well, good morning. It's good to see you here this morning. I call your attention to our announcements. And there's a couple that aren't in the bulletin. Uh, first, uh, on that, uh, the flowers are given in memory of uh, Carolyn Hamrick about her family. Uh, they're beautiful, and I hope all enjoy them. Uh, and then next Sunday, that's the 31st of January, unless that's changed too, but anyway, <laughs> We'll count it next Sunday. Uh, at 4 o'clock, we'll have an administrative council meeting. Uh, and it's uh, open to all, so I heard you to come. Uh, <clears throat> in our announcements, uh, Bible studies have started in uh, Romans. Uh, but if you'd like to att attend a study, there are Zoom studies, both of them, on uh, Tuesday evening and Wednesday morning. Uh, you can. first chapter has been covered, so if you wanted to start this week, Read the first and second chapters, and that would be good. Uh, it's good to sign up to receive text. If something happens, uh, this beautiful day, we don't want to think about it, but if something happens and we have inclement weather, it would be good to know what's going on and whether we're going to have services or not or things such as that. So I encourage you to call and, and get those announcements. Uh, we're going to have a multiple ways of... Uh, serving the ashes during Ash Wednesday, which isn't that far away, February 17th. Uh, and there's three ways. Uh, you can all read those ways uh, that one or three you can have, uh, or you can participate in more than one if you wanted to. But uh, we'll go into those in more details in the coming week, so everyone's acquainted with those. That's our announcements for today. Let's move those aside and turn to the Lord in worship. The Lord is with you. And also with you. May we pray. Oh, Lord our God, we just thank you for this beautiful day you've given us, this grand and glorious day. It is a day you have made, and we'll rejoice and be glad in it. May your spirit be upon us, and may we hear you and respond to you in spirit and in truth. In the power and glory of your name, the great I am, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. The uh, first hymn is in the bulletin, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Let's stand and sing softly. good way to express it and our love for God in the Apostles' Creed. So that important question, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, 
He ascended in heaven and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We'll turn to the Lord now in prayer, and as our custom, we'll have a time of silence to begin with, and I will lead us forward. May we pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we just praise and glorify you and thank you. All of us must confess that we take some things so for granted that you have given us that are marvelous and wonderful gifts. May we rejoice in all things and see you in all the many ways you manifest yourself. And thank you for how you care for each and every one of us, for how you love everyone in this whole world. For you didn't come for just a few, but you came for everyone. And now we know it is our job as believers to live the faith. And when others ask why we do what we do, we can give them the explanation. Because Jesus saved my soul. So may we be your witnesses, your good witnesses in all that we're about. Carry us forward and let us be thankful in all that we see and appreciate what you have done for us. Lord, we thank you for this community, for the good things that are in the community. We acknowledge it's not perfect. We acknowledge there are things to be done, but there is a lot of good things that are going on, and we thank you for that. We thank you for our school systems. We thank you for the hospital we have and the first responders that stand there in this time of the pandemic and other needs that are there. Lord, we thank you for our first responders the ambulance drivers, the paramedics, the fire department, the police and sheriff's department. Lord, we thank you for their response to keep order in our community and to keep our community moving well. And we appreciate them and thank you for them. We thank you for the leaders of our community and all that they're about, that we are ever more looking for ways to improve the community. Lord, we thank you that we are a community that has many jobs. Yet we're a community that have many people that are seeking jobs now. And we pray that in the coming weeks and months, those jobs will open up. And we will have the employment for those who need employment. Lord, guide us in this task. We thank you for this state we live in and how it's been so receptive to business and how business has moved in. And we thank you that those opportunities are available for all of our citizens. May we seize the opportunities and make the best of what we have and be thankful to you. Lord, carry us forward in everything. For we know that it's not just about us, but it's about this whole world and you love it. Lord, we thank you for our nation. We thank you for the transition that is made that was smooth and peaceful. And we pray for all of our leaders. Lord, we pray that they will humble themselves and turn to you and seek the guidance that they need for whatever task that they have. For you will give the wisdom and the guidance that will but ask and seek it. Lord, we will pray for our leaders every day and seek that they will turn to you. Lord, we thank you for our world and know that you came for everyone in it and we pray for everyone in this world is engaged in this pandemic and suffers from it. May the suffering be alleviated as quickly as possible. And may we respond in other ways that all can flourish and have a good life. Lord, carry us forward to be your people of faith in all things. That we might worship you in all that we're about. And so now as your people of faith, we turn and we lift the prayer that you have given us, Lord Jesus, that we call the Lord's Prayer. As we say together, our Father, which art in heaven. How would be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Denise and Ryan. Brian, appreciate that. Beautiful. Our scripture lesson this morning is one I know you're familiar with. We're going to look at the story of Jonah. Jonah and the whale or Jonah and the big fish. Uh, the scripture is printed in your bulletins or you can follow in your Bibles. We're just going to read a few verses from the third chapter of Jonah. And, but we'll talk, we're going to talk about the whole story. But hear the word of God. Uh, Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. And Jonah began to go to the city going a day's walk. And he cried out, 
40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God and they proclaimed a fast. And everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. And when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Our thanks be to God. You know, I got to tell you, I, this is one of my favorite Old Testament stories. It really is. I, I, I've heard this story since I was, uh, gosh, I don't remember when I heard it. When I was a little boy, and I know you have to. You know it well. It starts off when God tells Jonah, one of his prophets, to go to Nineveh and to preach. And he gives them the message to preach. Forty days more and Nineveh will be overturned. Nineveh will be destroyed. And Jonah doesn't want to do it. For a number of reasons, we're going to talk about some of those reasons. He doesn't like Nineveh. He doesn't like the people of Nineveh. He doesn't like the message he's about to proclaim. He's got some other problems too we'll talk about in a minute. So he decides not to do it. So rather than go to Nineveh, he gets on a boat and he goes in the exact opposite direction to a town called Tarshish. And so on the way, on the way, this great storm comes up. And the ship is tossed from side to side. And the storm gets worse and worse. And again, you know this story. And, and Jonah comes to the sailors and he said, look, guys, it's my fault. It's my fault. I'm being disobedient to God. Uh, just throw me overboard and I'm sure the storm will cease. And the sailors say, no, 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 no. We're not going to do that. You'll die if we throw you overboard. No, it'll be okay. We'll weather the storm. And the storm gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And the sailors go, well, you know, maybe he's right. You know, maybe we ought to throw him overboard after all. And, and Jonah said, I told you. And they did. They threw him overboard. And two things happened immediately. The sea got calm. And then comes a big fish or a whale. Well, big fish comes and swallows uh, Jonah and takes him off. Ends up taking him right where he's supposed to be in the first place, to Nineveh, and the big fish spits him out on the sea. I guess, uh, I guess disobedient prophets don't taste good to fish. I don't know. But anyway, he spits him out on the sea. And that takes us to where we are this morning. God says to Jonah, says, now let's try it again. <laughs> let's try it again. Go immediately to the city of Nineveh and tell them, in 40 days, I will destroy the city. So let's recap. Jonah was in a place he didn't want to go to. He was talking to people he didn't want to talk to. He was talking to people he hated. He was telling them a message he didn't want to preach and they didn't want to hear. And he had just spent three days inside a fish. What could go wrong with that, right? That doesn't sound to me like a recipe for success if you ask me. And yet, Jonah's words ignite a revival that not only touched humanity, but Scripture says touched all of creation. It's a remarkable story in a number of ways. First of all, it's remarkable in the, in the fact that it didn't happen in Israel. If this had happened in, in Judah, if this had happened in Israel, we could have understood it. If it happened in, in, in God's chosen people, it would be a wonderful, beautiful story. But it didn't happen. The good guys in this, the heroes in this, the faithful people in this are the arch enemies of the children of Israel. The Assyrians, the one who mean them great harm. It's a pagan nation. And, and when they hear the word of God, they respond. They respond, respond by praying and fasting and repenting. And they experience a great spiritual renewal. These people, these people who had threatened the very existence of the children of Israel. These people who had been so brutal to God's people through the years. God blesses and saves. And you wonder, why in the world was this book even part of Jewish scripture? Why did the Jewish people even include this book in their book of, of prophets? I mean, they the, look like the idiots and, 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 and the people of, of Assyria look like the, the faithful ones, look like the hero. And why is this book read every Yom Kippur in Jewish families all over the world? It must tell us something really important about God. And it does. It does. Let me share with you three things very quickly. First of all, the story of Jonah reveals to us God's amazing mercy. It reveals to us God's amazing mercy. We see the children of Israel once again threatened by a rebellious pagan superpower. Again, their very existence is at stake. 
The Assyrians are going to come and they're eventually going to destroy the children of Israel. And the question hangs in the air, what's God going to do about this? What's God going to do to protect us? Surely the Lord Almighty will come down and destroy them. Surely the Lord God will destroy them like he had the Canaanites and the uh, Egyptians. After all, that's what gods do. Gods are supposed to protect their people. Well, not this time and not this God. Not this God of creation. Yes, it's true. If you read the Old Testament, you find story after story of how the Lord God Almighty pronounces judgment and justice upon rebellious pagan nations like Egypt and like the Canaanites and a host of others. But if you go back and you read those stories carefully, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find that in each time before any judgment or punishment is sent, there's always a time of God reaching out to them. Reaching out to them in love, in grace, in mercy. Too often people read the Old Testament and find a God of vengeance and justice and punishment. You can find that God, but only if you ignore all the other stuff. Only if you ignore the times when God tries to bestow mercy and grace and love upon humanity. The God of the Old Testament is, is, hear me, is a God of mercy and grace and love. Now make no mistake about it. The Assyrians were bad people. They were the most godless, they were pagans, they were violent, they were cruel, they were greedy, and they were idolatrous. There was no other nation on earth more godless than the Assyrians, and especially those who lived in Nineveh. And as we read, we see that Jonah's major personal problem was not only did he not like the Assyrians. Not only did he not like the people in Nineveh, not only were they his arch enemies, but one of the main reasons he didn't want anything to do with them is that he didn't want to go and preach this message. In 40 days, you will be destroyed, that God would destroy them, and then God not do it. He wanted, if he was going to say that, he wanted to see. Jonah hoped that God would do it. Jonah hoped that God would rain down fire and brimstone on them as he had on Sodom. And that he would tear down their walls and allow their enemies to defeat them like he had the people of Jericho. But he's afraid. He's afraid that God's just not going to do it. And he doesn't want to get wrapped up in that. He says later in the book, he says, God, you're like this. You're just always like this. You're always spouting fire and brimstone and destruction, and you're always ended up being kind and loving and grace-filled. And quite honestly, God, that's annoying. He knows that. Jonah knew that God was the God of creation, the God of the covenant, that the God of Israel was full of mercy. He knew that God would do all that he could to save these people, and he was afraid he was going to end up looking like a fool, saying in 40 days you're going to be destroyed, and then God would repent and save his people. It's as if Jonah knew somehow in his heart that Jesus would say 700 years later to Nicodemus, for God so loved this world that he did everything, that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him, God would not destroy, they would not perish, but have everlasting life. See, Jonah chose in his limited humanity not to see the people like God saw them. In Jonah's heart, these Assyrians were easy, more easy to, to throw away than to work with. He believed that some people were not worth the effort. And I'm glad this morning that God didn't share Jonah's opinion. And by the way, by the way, nor was God going to allow Jonah to sit on the sidelines while he sent another prophet. That would have been easy to do. It would have been easy enough to have Jonah to sail off to Tarshish and never hear from him again. And, and God raise up another prophet to go to Nineveh. Well, Jonah, if you're not going to be part of this great miracle, this great blessing, I'll send somebody else. No. No, God loved and had mercy on Jonah too. God was not going to leave Jonah in a state of, of disobedience, in a state of, 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 of rebellion. The Lord decided to still use Jonah even though he was imperfect, even though he was difficult to work with because of say mercy and love that God wanted to bestow upon the people of Nineveh. He wanted for Jonah as well. All this ought to cause us to, to take a step back. And think about our own lives. 
Examine our own hearts. Do we sometimes get that same attitude Jonah does? I think sometimes we do. I do. I think sometimes we think, you know what? I'm just tired of dealing with these people, whatever these people mean to you. I'm tired of, of dealing with it. I've tried and tried and tried and tried, and I've gotten nowhere. I don't like these people. I don't want to deal with these people. And we don't want to hurt them. We don't want to cause harm to come to them. But we say, I'm just going to sit back. I'm just going to be quiet. And I'm not going to go out of my way to share with them the love of God, the grace of God. Let somebody else feed the hungry. Let somebody else house the homeless. Let somebody else clothe the naked. Let somebody else share the good news of Jesus Christ with those who are lost. Let somebody else go to the urban area. Somebody else go to the, the mission field in Central America or Africa or wherever. And just leave me alone. I'm done. I'm tired with it. Let somebody Somebody else go who's got more time, who's got more resources, got more skill, got more faith, and just leave me alone. And we just sit back and hope that God will send somebody else. So we can fall in that trap so easily. Second thing I want to say to you is this. Don't ever, ever forget that this story reveals to us the awesome power of repentance. The awesome power of repentance. As we stated earlier, no prophet in all of Israel was more of a failure than Jonah. Right? He preached. Forty days, Nineveh's going to be destroyed. He, he didn't preach, Lord, he didn't preach, Nineveh, uh, you need to repent. He didn't preach, Nineveh, come to faith and everything's going to be okay. No, in 40 days, you're going to be destroyed. Forty days passed and Nineveh wasn't destroyed. His message did not come true. He was a failure as a prophet in that way. But yet, at the same time, no one else's words were more used by the Holy Spirit to bring about revival than Jonah's words were. That one simple message that nobody wanted to hear was all that it took. How's that possible? How did that work? What was different? How did that simple message like that, that message that they didn't want to hear, he didn't want to say in a place he didn't want to be, how did that permeate all of society and lead to a time of complete restoration, redemption, and transformation in that land? How? I mean, after all, we've been praying for revival. We've been praying for revival in our church, in our denomination, in our nation, in our world. We've been praying and praying and praying and praying and praying and working and striving. And, 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 and we wait to see the great revival come. What's the secret? Well, one word. Repentance. Repentance. It wasn't the power of Jonah's preaching that did it. It was the miracle of repentance. It didn't originate from Jonah. It came from the moving of God's Holy Spirit. God merely allowed Jonah to be the catalyst for the outpouring of that great spiritual revival. And sometimes I sit back and say, oh, I wish I could have seen that. Oh, I wish I could have seen that. I don't know how it happened. Maybe a, a, a group of people said, you know, uh, maybe, maybe if we repent, the Lord will change his mind. And they began, they poured out before the Lord. And they put on the sackcloth and they threw ashes on their heads and they fell before the Lord. And, and maybe it started to grow and grow and grow until it reached the palace. In fact, the king became the leader. The king led the nation in repentance as the king himself put on ashes and sackcloth. And the whole nation repented. By the way, you notice that that's kind of the complete reversal of the third chapter of Genesis. The third chapter of Genesis is the fall of humanity, the Adam and Eve and the snake and the apple story. You remember what happened in that story, right? God said, don't touch you know, eat anything you want, but don't touch the fruit on that tree. You know, and, and Eve flicked it and Eve gave it to Adam and, and, they, and they ate it and God showed up and God said, I told you not to do that. You were disobedient to me. And what happened? Well, a lot of things happened. Uh, Eve decided she'd blame uh, Adam. Adam decided he blamed Eve. Eve decided she'd blame the snake. The snake decided, the snake said, hey, don't blame me, God. You made me, right? You created all things. You made me like this. You made me deceitful like, like this. It's your fault. So Adam blamed Eve and Eve blamed the snake and the snake blamed God. The one thing you don't see in that story is repentance. It's repentance. One has to wonder, what would have happened what would have happened if Adam and Eve and, and maybe even the serpent fell to the ground and cried out for forgiveness? Said, Lord, you're right. You're right. 
We're so sorry you told us we could have anything we wanted in the garden except for the fruit of this tree and we disobeyed you. Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive us. What would have happened? Yet this is exactly what happened in the city of Nineveh. All of creation falls before the Lord, eager and ready to repent and turn from its ways. All of creation undergoes a period of fasting and penitence through the wearing of sackcloth and ashes. Jonah's story is far more than just a children's story. Far more than just a fish tale. It's a story of God's love for humanity. It's a story about the power of repentance. And once again, we need to step back and ponder. Are we too proud? Too arrogant? Too busy? To search our hearts this day and see if there's any areas of our hearts we need to repent of? Is there malice in our heart? Is there anger in our hearts? Is there greed and pride in our hearts that we need to lay down before the Lord? Friends, there's freedom and power and life and joy in laying before the Lord our sins and asking for God's forgiveness. And finally, the last thing I'll say is this is a story of gratitude and rejoicing. The story ends with the city of Nineveh in great revival. God has spared them. Forty days have come and gone. God didn't destroy them. It says quite, quite uh, clearly, God changed God's mind. The King James might say, God repented. God changed God's mind and God spared the city of Nineveh. There's all kind of theological implications in that we'll talk about one day. But God spared the city of Nineveh and the people rejoiced. And a great revival uh, broke out. And Nineveh sitting on a hill looking down and looking at the great revival and pouting. I knew it. Exactly what I was afraid going to happen. I preached 40 days you're going to be destroyed, and God did it. God changed his mind. God gave them grace and mercy and salvation. And now they're rejoicing. I knew God would save these folks. By the way, that's exactly how the story of the prodigal son ends, isn't it? You remember the story of the prodigal son where the younger son said, Dad, give me all that's mine. And he went off and spent it all in riotous living and, and came back a broken man and, and thought maybe his father would let him be a slave or a servant in his household. And the father welcomed him back and killed the fatted calf. And they had a great big party for the younger son. And the older brother, the older brother said, Dad, Dad, I stayed here all this time and I worked for you. I, I just worked like a slave in the field for you. And you never so much gave me even a party for my friends. And now you kill the fatted calf and you put the, 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 the purple robe on, on the son and uh, on the younger son and, 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 and the, he got mad and he went off too. And the story of the prodigal son ends with the older brother sitting far back watching this party take place just like Jonah is watching this party take place. And we don't know if either of them ever came down and joined the celebration. Will you come down and join the celebration and joy and and blessing and thanksgiving of what God has done for you. Let me close with this story. I don't know if it's true or not. I just read it recently. The story is told that there was a, a gentleman who got this COVID virus and, and it affected him pretty bad. And he ended up in the hospital. I see he finally was on a ventilator for quite a while. He was one of the lucky ones. He came off the ventilator and, and he got better and got stronger and they sent him home to, to recuperate. And, and he was home and he was doing okay. One day his, uh, his wife walked by and saw him sitting at his desk just weeping. She came by and she put his hand, her hand on him and said, what's, what's, what's happening? What's, what's wrong? He said, well, I'm just going over this hospital bill here. That will make anybody cry. I was, uh, he said, I was just going over this hospital bill and I, I'm just looking to see how much it cost those few days I was in ICU on that ventilator. He said, this is, this is amazing how expensive this was. And he was tearing up and she said, well, honey, don't worry about it. I mean, we've got Medicare and we've got a supplement and, and what they don't pay, it, it won't be much. We have plenty of money to pay it. And he goes, no, that's not it. He says, well, what's wrong? He says, you know, I, I was just thinking. He says, all these decades I've lived my life. I've been breathing God's air on my own for free. And I've just taken it for granted. I'm so ashamed. I'm so ashamed I wasn't more grateful for the blessing of just breathing. He said, every morning I got out of bed all my life and I've stretched and I've took a, a great big 
breath of clean, cool, fresh air. And I never once thank God for it. I hope you're grateful this morning. There's so much to be grateful for. So much in our world, in our nation, in our lives that we should be grateful for this day. Especially a God of mercy and grace. Yeah, this book is much more than just a, a fish tale. It's a story that reveals the mercy and love of God. It's a story that reminds us of the power of repentance. And it's a story that reminds us to open our eyes and to see God at work around us and all we should be grateful for. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand once again and sing softly as we sing about the amazing grace of God. It's one of the favorite hymns of the church. And as we do, will you ponder, will you meditate on how good God's grace is, how what a blessing it is. Let's stand as we sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Now go forth from this place with God's amazing grace in your heart. Go forth from this place and remember the power of repentance. Search your heart and see if there be any wickedness there that we need to lay before God's cross this week. And go forth from this place as a grateful people. Grateful for all the blessing that God has given you. And go forth and be blessed. Be blessed by God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in the joy of Christ. Thank you.